Okay, let me see. Okay, good. So now the screen sharing is done. No, sorry, now the recording is done. And the screen sharing, uh, can can you see the screen or not? Yes, sir. You you can see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, can, can you see the screen now? Sir, can I can. Can you see the slide? No, sir, can I can't see the slides. You cannot see the slides. Why? I don't know. Shall I stop presenting and do it again, maybe? Let me stop presenting. Okay, and uh, share the window again. Okay. You are presenting your screen. So can can you see my screen now? Yes, sir, but not your uh, not the slides. Okay. Now can you see the slide? No, sir. Still not. Uh, what about other students? Can can you also all of you cannot see the slide? No, sir, we can't. Why? I Stop sharing, sharing a window. Stop presenting once again. Present now. Your entire screen. Okay, can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, now can you see the slide? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, since uh, I started about 10 minutes ago, maybe, and the recording is not done. So anyways, I will repeat it <laughs> so that the recording is completed. So you don't have to, but okay. It's okay, I, I will repeat a little. Okay. If, if a lot of time has passed, then I would not surely. But right now, uh, I, the recording would be okay. Done. Thank you. Okay, so once again, but anyways, uh, uh, who told me that the recording was not done? Thank you, because <laughs> because I forgot it. <laughs> okay. So okay, uh, we discussed uh, in our last class about uh, the Rankine cycle, and basically, uh, it's a vapor. Uh, it's it's a vapor power uh, power cycle so we were discussing about heat engines so in chapter number nine the power cycles were all gas based so basically air was the working fluid there but here in chapter number 10 we are discussing about uh, using water as the working fluid since we have to use the water as the working fluid so Carnot cycle was needed to be modified okay because we cannot directly use the Carnot cycle with water as a working fluid. There are issues in the compression stage as well as there were issues in the expansion stage. And we discussed those issues in our last class. And then we modified the Carnot cycle for water as a working fluid. And that modified Carnot cycle for water is now named as the Rankine cycle. So the Rankine cycle is composed of four processes. Uh, four components are needed for that. The Four processes are as follows. Uh, just as a summary, the first process is the compression process, which is done in the liquid state. So we needed a pump for it. So state point one to two is the compression or pressurization of the liquid. Then from two to three, we enter the liquid into boiler. And within the boiler, initially preheating, then vaporization, and then superheating of the water is done. So we have a superheated water at the exit of the boiler, and this superheated vapor is then entered into the turbine, which is basically the steam turbine. The steam turbine mostly operates in the superheated region. So the exit of the steam turbine will be saturated vapor or the vapor with very, very small moisture content. Okay, because the steam turbine is not designed to handle any moisture, so the moisture content is required to be kept as small as possible. Okay, or it, no moisture is the best, but if there is moisture, that should be as small as possible. Uh, 
So that will be the state point four. And then from state point four, we enter the, uh, the, ex the, the exit of turbine is connected with the condenser. The condenser do the condensation at constant temperature and constant pressure until we have a saturated liquid at the exit of the condenser, which is then fed back into the pump. So this is the Rankine cycle. Then in our last class, what we discussed is that how we can increase the efficiency of the Rankine cycle. This is always an important issue. Uh, we want to have a power generation, but we want to have as much efficient as possible. So th there are three possibilities that we did discussed before in the last class. The first possibility is by increasing the boiler pressure. If we increase the boiler pressure, this curve is going to move up. And when this curve is going to move up, so the area under the curve is going to increase, and this will result in an increase in the efficiency of the cycle. The second possibility is that if we do the process at lower condenser pressure, at lower con condenser pressure, what will happen is that this curve is going to move down, and so again, the area under the curve is going to increase, and this is going to increase the efficiency of the cycle. The third possibility is that if we do larger superheating, so if we increase the superheat from the boiler, this is going to increase the efficiency of the cycle, but at the same time, we came to know that uh, there is a specific limitation, maximum temperature which the steam turbine can bear. And so we cannot have boiling, boiler doing superheating beyond that temperature. So there is a temperature limit to which, uh, which must be met. Otherwise, the steam turbine is going to be damaged, is going to be deformed and will not work properly. So we came up with another idea that instead of uh, doing the expansion process in the turbine in one step, we do the expansion in multi-stages. Okay, so we do this expansion in the high pressure turbine, then we take the, all of the, uh, then we take all of the steam out and take it to the boiler, do the reboiling until it reaches again to the same boiler temperature. And then after that, we do the rest of the expansion. So this is again going to increase the efficiency of the Rankine cycle. So these were the three or four methodologies which we discussed in our last class, how we can actually improve the efficiency of the Rankine cycle. Now today, in this uh, lecture, we're going to look at some other aspect, that how we can increase the efficiency of the Rankine cycle. The, this aspect is given the name, the ideal regenerative Rankine cycle. So we are going to discuss the ideal regenerative Rankine cycle. There are two different forms of ideal regenerating Rankine cycle. One is with an open feed water heater, the other is with a closed feed water heater. We're going to discuss both of them, but let's first start with an open feed water heater. Okay. The very first question which arises in mind is that uh, what is the advantage of this? How we are going to increase the efficiency of the cycle by using the ideal regenerative Rankine cycle? Uh, I will answer this question by the end of my explanation. Okay, so let's first look at how this kind of a cycle works. So basically from the boiler, we have uh, steam, superheated steam going into the turbine. And uh, let's say that this superheated steam is at a high pressure. Okay, now if I draw the turbine here, you have to understand one thing. We have a turbine inlet and turbine inlet as, is at a high pressure. And then as the steam flows through the turbine, uh, the pressure of the steam keeps on reducing, reducing, reducing until at the exit of turbine, at the outlet of the turbine, we have a low pressure. Now what we do is that we make a small hole somewhere in the center of the turbine. This small hole will cause the bleeding of the steam out of the turbine. So we take some of the bleed out of the turbine. And obviously, since this hole is somewhere in the middle of the turbine, so the pressure of the bleed will be greater than the inlet, will be greater than the, than the outlet pressure, but it will be less than the inlet pressure. So it will be somewhere in between. Let's call it medium pressure. So the pressure of the bleed will be Pm. This Pm will be less than pH, but will be greater than Pl. 
Okay. Now let's say that uh, thirty. Per, let's say that the hundred percent of the working fluid steam was going into the turbine. Out of the hundred percent, seventy thirty percent is taken out as bleed. So if thirty percent is taken out as bleed, then hundred minus thirty, the remaining seventy percent will go from the exit of the turbine. Okay, so so seventy percent is going to go from the exit of the turbine. Now this seventy percent is going to go through the condenser, which we want it to go through the condenser. Okay, uh, so they, it will be condensed, and after condenser, we pass it through a pump which does not raise the pressure from PL to pH directly. No, the first pump is going to raise the pressure from PL to PM only. This will be the work of the first pump, okay? So pump one will only raise the pressure from, so here will be PL, low pressure, and so low pressure will be raised to PM, medium pressure, okay, by pump one. Now, the bleed coming out, was also at pm okay the bleed coming was was also, was was also at pm now we have two fluids coming uh, at the same pressure we can now mix them openly so this is an open feed water heater open feed water heater is basically a simple open box where you can just simply put two different fluids together and mix them together physically Okay, so uh, the so, so so basically the working fluid, which was actually divided into two parts, thirty percent and seventy percent, then now meets back again, mixes back again from seventy, thirty percent plus seventy percent, it becomes again hundred percent in the open feed water heater. Okay, so seventy percent was coming from here. Uh, remember the seventy and thirty percent that I'm putting here. I'm just giving an example. Okay. The actual value for an equation might be different. Okay, so there's 30%, let's say 70% coming from here. 30 and 70 is going to mix up here, and it will become again 100%. Okay, so uh, this mixing is done, and as this mixing is done, the exit comes out at state point 3. Okay, and uh, this comes out as uh, saturated liquid, and this saturated liquid is then pumped back into the second pump, and this second pump is now going to raise the pressure from PM to pH to high pressure. Okay, so this is PM, and from PM the pressure will be raised to to pH. Okay, now this pH will go into the boiler, will become heated again, and then this is how the cycle continues. Now you have to understand, you have to look here that what is happening. Okay, we are doing uh, in, here, but if you see here, we are not doing the pressurization in one step. We are not doing the pumping in one step. We are doing the pumping in two steps, from PL to PM, then PM to pH. We are not doing it directly as PL to pH. Okay, now what is the advantage of it? The advantage of it is that if you look here, suppose if we do the pumping in one step, so it will go like from here to here directly. Now you have to understand one thing. Pumping means we have to supply the work in. Okay, pumping means we have to supply the work in. Whenever you have to supply the work in, it, this is going to decrease your W net. Because W net is basically what? The work produced by the, by the turbine minus the work required by the pump. Okay, now one way was that I have all the fluid, 100% fluid, that I have to raise the pressure from low pressure to high pressure. Now what I'm doing is that I'm reducing the amount of fluid for which I have to raise the pressure from low to high. So for part of the fluid, I have to raise the pressure from medium to high, and for the rest of the fluid, I have to raise the pressure from low to high. So I am actually reducing the work input for the bleed. The bleed is the thing for which I'm actually reducing the work input, which was actually needed by the pump. Now, the amount of work input needed by the pump itself was very little. But you have to understand one thing, that pumps are quite expensive material in terms of what, what, uh, what amount of fluid they handle. 
the larger amount of the fluid needed, the bigger will be the size of the pump, and they are much, much more expensive in terms of their capital, in terms of their economy. Okay, so it's easier to handle a smaller pumps compared to, to to handling larger pump. Larger pump, in not in terms of how much pressure rise they go through, but in terms of how much liquid they handle, how much flow they can handle. Okay, so by by going through this open feed water heater arrangement, we are we are able to reduce the pump work needed in the sense that we are also able to utilize the smaller pumps, the pumps that can handle smaller amount of fluid, okay? And so we're going to actually save a lot of capital, a lot of money in the, in, in, in the design of the system. So it's going to achieve the same output as it would have achieved by a single pump, but the single pump would be a, a much more expensive because it has to handle large amount of fluid Okay, add to raise the pressure from low to high. But here we are using two pumps, and one of the pump which is going to raise the pressure from low to high will not be handling all of the fluid. Will be handling the fluid, uh, working fluid minus the bleed. So less amount of fluid it will handle. So it will be uh, comparatively less expensive. So before moving towards, before moving forward, first of all, do you understand the logic why we are using this kind of a system? What advantage does it give? Uh, is, it, is it clear so far? Anybody have any question to ask? You guys can hear me. Hello? Uh, students, can you hear me? Can you watch? Did, did, did you go through whatever I was going with you in the lecture? Is there anyone available? Strange, I'm not getting response from anybody. Students, are you online? Abdul Hadi. Bilal, Uzair, Osama. Students, can you hear me? Students, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. <laughs> I, I thought that I was just speaking with myself. Nobody no. was answering. Uh, I was just getting my mic to work. Okay, but throughout the lecture, whatever I mentioned, you were able to hear me properly, yes, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, anyway, so this is the main idea for an ideal regenerative Rankine cycle. Now let's talk about uh, uh, how how do we how do we present it on the TS diagram? On the TS diagram, first of all, uh, the boiler process is done from state four to state point five. Okay, so we are doing the 
a boiling process uh, in this. And the superheated vapor is going to come out at 5. From 5, it's going to enter into the turbine. Now, from the turbine, at uh, it's going to enter at pH. So as it moves through the turbine, the pressure is going to be dropped. And let's say PM is the pressure, medium pressure, at which the bleed is taken out. And that will be the state point 0.6. Okay, and when we say the bleed is taken out, so we represent the bleed in terms of the fraction of amount of the of of the vapor which is going out. So let's say that the y fraction is is the bleed which is coming out of the turbine. Then the remaining one minus y is going to go through the rest of the turbine, and then the remaining one of one minus y is going to come out of the turbine exit. And then from the turbine exit, it's going to enter into the condenser. So 1 minus y is going to go through the condenser itself. Okay. So the condenser will behave at, uh, will work at low pressure. And then it enters into the pump one, where the first round of pressurization is done. But this round of pressurization is not done for the entire fluid, which will be done for, uh, for only 1 minus y fraction of the fluid. Then it will be mixed with the with the bleed coming out from the turbine, okay? And this mixing will be open mixing. Uh, we can apply the energy balance in the, at the open feed water heater. And then all of the fluid is going to enter into pump two where it will be, where the pressure will be raised from, uh, from PM to pH. And so this way the process cycle works and continues. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, the other possibility. This was for the case of an open feed water heater arrangement. We have another possibility that we can use the closed feed water heater. Okay, suppose if you want to use the closed feed water heater, the arrangement would be a slightly different. Now, since we are using the closed feed water heater for mixing, we do not we do not need to have the two fluids directly mixed with each other. Rather, what we do is that since it is a closed feed water heater, we pass the two fluids through a heat exchanger where one side of the heat exchanger we have the bleed and the other side of the heat exchanger we have the turbine exit coming out through the condenser via the pump. And the two fluids are going to exchange heat only instead of mixing together. Okay, so here what we will have is that uh, in the same way if we start from the boiler from the boiler we have uh, the fluid coming out at high pressure okay so that's let's call it pH okay and uh, going into the turbine somewhere in the center of the turbine we have the bleed which is coming out at medium pressure and then at the exit of the turbine we have the rest of the fluid which is coming out at low pressure Okay, let's say the bleed is coming out at well, y fraction is coming out from the bleed. And then one minus y will move through the condenser. I uh, will move through the turbine exit into the condenser, and then from the condenser into the pump. Now, since we are not directly mixing the two fluids for the heat transfer, so what we can do is that we can use the pump to directly raise the pressure from low pressure to high pressure. So we are not going to for 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 pump one. We are not going to uh, increase the pressure from low to medium. Rather, what we are going to do is we are going to directly raise the pressure from, from low pressure to high pressure. <clears throat> so we have a high pressure fluid at the exit of pump one, but not all of the fluid, only one minus y fraction of the fluid. Now this fluid was going to pass through the heat exchanger where on the inside, where the inner side will, will be the the fluid coming from the turbine exit and outside of this heat exchanger will have the the bleed coming out from the turbine the bleed and the inside fluid are going to mix together not not mix together they're going to exchange heat with each other in the closed feed water heater okay and uh, the bleed is going to come out at state point three which is now going to enter into pump two since the bleed was at pm medium pressure so its pressure is now going to be raised by pump two to high pressure. So now this high pressure bleed is going to be mixed directly with the high pressure uh, fluid coming out from the exit of turbine and the pump one. Okay, so the two fluids are going to be mixed in the mixing chamber and then returned into the boiler. 
Okay, so the idea in this kind of a, in this kind with, with using closed feed water heater is that we have both the pumps of the same rating. Okay, so this pump is also going to raise the pressure from from low pressure to to high pressure. Okay, and this pump is going to raise the pressure from medium pressure to high pressure. So both the pumps are actually raising the pressure from medium to high and low to high. <clears throat> and we do not need to mix the two fluids at different pressures. Okay, so that is the main difference between using the closed feed water heater or the open feed, feed water heater in the regenerator. The main advantage of using this regenerative Rankine cycle is that we can actually reduce the capital investment uh, from the economic side uh, or the pumps or for the for the feed water heater. From the energy wise, energy uh, from, from the energy side, there is advantage, but that advantage is not that much significant. But the capital side advantage is much more high since uh, less expensive pumps can be used. So let's uh, try to solve a problem related with ideal regenerative Rankine cycle. So let's have a look at it. Consider a steam power plant operating on the ideal regenerative Rankine cycle with one open feed water heater. Okay, so we have an open feed water heater. One, steam enters the turbine at 15 megapascal and 600 degrees centigrade and is condensed in a condenser at a pressure of 10 kilopascal. Some steam leaves the turbine at a pressure of 1.2 megapascal and enters the open feed water heater. Determine the fraction of steam extracted from the turbine and thermal efficiency of the cycle. Okay, so let's have a look at it. What are the, what are the factors we have here? P, uh, pressure, temperature, uh, X, S, uh, H, okay, specific volume. So these are the these are the things that we have here. Okay, now let's talk about uh, how many state points we have. We have state points one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so let's have a look at it. Uh, steam enters the turbine at fifteen megapascal, six hundred degrees centigrade. Okay, so we know state point five, temperature and pressure. Okay, so if we know what is the temperature and pressure at state five, so the pressure of a state five will be the same as the pressure at state four. So that means we also know what is the pressure at state four. Okay, so pressure at state four is also known in that sense. <clears throat> okay, and it's condensed in a condenser at a pressure of 10 kilopascal. So we know what is the pressure of the condenser. If we know the pressure of the condenser, P7, that means we also know what is the pressure P1 because they are the same. So we know P1 and we know P7. Some steam leaves the turbine at a pressure of 1.2 megapascal. So obviously this is the medium pressure. Uh, the medium pressure will be state point six, three, and two. So two, three, and six, these pressures are. So basically we know all the pressures, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The next thing is that there are, there, there are a few things which are pretty understood okay, in this cycle, that is state point one and state point three should be saturated liquid. If they are saturated liquid, that means we know what is the X value for one and three. Okay, so that will be zero. So we know X at one, we know X at three. So these are pretty understood within this uh, uh, cycle. So now let's start analyzing, okay? So we need to know all the enthalpies first, okay? so. Uh, for state point one, since we know P and X, so these two properties are enough to determine the enthalpy H, and we can also find V. Now, because one to two is the pump, and if you remember for the case of the pump, we discussed that the work input is determined as V P2 minus P1, and this will be the same as H2 minus H1. So the idea is that if you know the two pressures and if you know the specific volume, you can find what is the work in. Then if you know H1 and work in, you can find H2. So here, this is the thing we have. We know V, we know P1 and P2. So we'll find work in. If we know the work in of the pump then we, and we know H1, we can find H2. In the same way for, 
for uh, for the second pump it is from three to four so we have pressure and x we have p and x so we can find h and v and then since we know uh, h and v and p, p3 and p4 so we can find what is w in for the second pump and then correspondingly we can find what is h4 so we have uh, enthalpies related with the pump inlet and exit both the pumps okay then let's talk about the state point five five six and seven the, this is basically the turbine and turbine should be at uh, the vertical line on the ts diagram if it is isentropic turbine so uh, since at state point five we know what is the temperature and pressure so we can actually determine what is the entropy and uh, so this entropy will be the same for state point six as well as for state point seven now since we know these things so we can find h for state point five six and seven directly because we have two properties for each case so here this is how we actually determine all the enthalpies at all the state points now what we need to do is we need to do we need to find the fraction of the steam extracted from the turbine and the thermal efficiency for finding the fraction what we can do is we can uh, we can apply the energy balance at the open feed water heater okay so we have this open feed water heater so there are two fluids going in so this is that's from state point six going in and this is from state point two going in okay and one going out okay so total energy going in will be the same as the total energy going out so that means uh, uh, m dot six h six plus m dot two h two total going in should be equal to total going out which is m dot three h three or in terms of the fraction we can say that the y fraction is going coming out from six and one minus y was coming out from the exit of the turbine which is going to flow through here and going into the feed water heater from state point two so y is coming from state point six one minus y is coming from state point two and y when added with one minus y becomes one is actually leaving from state point five. so in terms of the fraction we can write here as y h6 plus 1 minus y h2 this will be equals to 1 into h3 okay so anybody want to anybody raise their hand anybody want to ask anything Okay. Okay. So uh, this will become our fundamental equation here. Now, since we know all the H's, H2, H3, and H6, only Y is unknown. So there, there we can actually determine the fraction of the steam extracted from the turbine. And for the thermal efficiency, since now we know all the, all the fractions and we know all the enthalpy, so we can actually determine the thermal efficiency as one minus Q out over Q in. So this is the blueprint of the solution. Now lo let's look at the solution ourselves, step by step. So for state point one, we have P1 is equals to 10 kilopascal, and we know what is it, it is saturated liquid. So we can find H1 and V1. And since we know P2, we can find work, work in for the first one. And based on that, we can determine actually what is H2. Similarly, between the state point three and state point four, we have the second pump. So we know what is P3 and we know that it is saturated liquid. We can determine what is V3 and H3. Then we also know what is P4. And so we can determine what is the work pump in for the second pump. And then using that uh, work pump in is equals to H4 minus H3, we can actually determine what is H4. So we determine all the four enthalpies for, for the case of the two pumps. And then for the state five, we can actually determine, we know what is the pressure and temperature. So we can determine the enthalpy and entropy. And this entropy as five will be the same as a six and the same as a seven. So for state point six, we know the entropy and the pressure. Similarly for the state point seven, we know the entropy and the pressure. And based on that, we can determine that what is the enthalpy at six and at seven. 
So once we have all the enthalpies, then we are going to do the energy balance over so the open feed water heater. And we are going to come up with this equation. This is the exact same equation that I developed just before. YH6 plus 1 minus YH2 is equals to 1H3. So 1 minus YH2 equals to 1H3. So we can use this equation to actually determine the fraction. Now, once you have determined the fraction, now we can find Q in and you can find Q out. And then eventually you can find what is the thermal efficiency. You have to remember one thing that when you are determining Q in, since all of the fluid is going through Q in, so Q in will be simply H5 minus H4. But when you have to find out the Q out, so Q out is actually coming out of the condenser and not all of the fluid is going through the condenser. So it's only one minus Y fraction is going through it. So it will be H7 H minus H1 multiplied by one minus Y because this is the fraction which is passing through the condenser. So you have to multiply with this fraction and you're gonna get Q out and then you can find out what is the efficiency. So this was the problem for the ideal regenerative Rankine cycle with open feed water heater. So the next top is, topic is related to cogeneration. Uh, if uh, anybody have any question regarding this, this, uh, the, the, this problem solution, please let me know. Okay, now let's start the next topic. The next topic is cogeneration. When we say cogeneration, uh, co simply means something together. It comes from cooperative. Okay, cooperative means doing things together. Okay, so cogeneration means generation of more than one thing together. Okay, so this is the general English meaning. Now, now how does it apply here in the power plant? design is that uh, normally whenever we are designing the plants our objective is to is to generate power this is our main power this is our main objective we want to generate power but let's say along with the generation of power we are generating something else along with it then then it becomes a cogeneration okay so the idea is that we are generating power but at the same time we are rejecting some of the heat from the condenser no, no. Suppose if we are in a specific condition that we can utilize the amount of energy which is being rejected by the condenser, then that energy rejection by the condenser will not be considered as waste. Rather, we will consider it as also as useful output. So technically, we are not increasing the power generation, but our efficiency of the cycle is going to increase because we are now saying that the waste which was supposed to be waste is now being used for some useful thing. Okay, so we are co-generating. We are generating power as well as a useful heat from the condenser, which is which might be used for, for several things, mostly in the industries for process heating and things like that. So cogeneration is a production of more than one useful form of energy. Most, for example, most common example is the process heat with the electrical power from the same energy source. So this is what we have. We have the same Rankine cycle, but the condenser, instead of saying it, calling it a condenser, now we call it as a process heater because the energy coming out of the condenser or the process heater will be used for process heating. And we consider it also as our output along with the uh, along with the uh, with the power generated by the turbine. So this is a simple uh, schematic to to have a specific cogeneration plot with adjustable loads. You can go through this uh, the schematic yourself. The next topic is about combined gas vapor power cycles. This is something uh, of, of significant significant importance. Uh, to most industries which are interested in generating power using the gas turbine. Uh, the, the idea is that the gas turbine cycle uses a compressor, combustion chamber, and the gas turbine. Okay, At the exit of gas turbine, we have uh, exhaust, and this exhaust is at a very high temperature. So much high temperature that if we pass it through the boiler of a Rankine cycle, it will actually start generating steam. So this is the idea. What we do is that we run the gas turbine and then we connect the exhaust of the gas turbine with the boiler of the Rankine cycle, with the, with the boiler of the steam turbine 
power generation system. So the boiler actually works from the exhaust of the gas turbine. So we do not need to supply any additional energy and we can still run a steam power turbine along with the gas turbine using the same energy that we supplied at the combustion chamber of the gas turbine cycle. So by a single input, we are actually generating two different outputs. And so this is known as the combined gas vapor power cycle. So we have two outputs and only one input. And so this becomes the most suitable arrangement for the case of uh, generating power using the gas turbine cycle. But most of the time, whenever we have a gas turbine cycle, it's never installed alone. Most of the time it is installed, whenever it is used for power generation, it is, is, it is installed in com combination with the steam uh, turbine as well. Since the exhaust of the gas turbine is significantly at high temperature and this could be used uh, to produce uh, the steam power. So this is the combined gas vapor power cycle. On the schematic diagram, it could be shown as follows, as, as, as shown here on the TS diagram. So that actually concludes the analysis of the power cycles, which are using the vapor, I mean the steam uh, or, the, or the water as a working fluid. And uh, uh, that, that, that actually concludes the analysis of Rankine cycle in this chapter. You have some practice problems related to chapter number 10. The solution of the practice problems are already provided to you in the Google Classroom. Uh, let's have a break of uh, 10 minutes and um, you can mark your attendance in, 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 in the chat box during this time. And uh, if anybody want to ask anything regarding chapter 10, you can ask right now. Otherwise, let's have a break. And then after the break, we are going to start chapter number 11, inshallah.
Okay, so since we have completed chapter number 10, now we are going to move towards uh, chapter number 11, which will be the last topic for thermodynamics, inshallah, uh, within this session. Uh, this chapter actually deals with the refrigeration cycle. Now, refrigeration cycle or refrigeration systems or refrigerator is something that you have came across with it in chapter number six when we started studying signal of thermodynamics. So there are two statements. The second statement of the second law of thermodynamics deals with the fact that normally uh, energy moves from the high temperature to the low temperature. And uh, if we make it pass through a specific system, it can actually generate uh, the work output. But since this is the general case, the reverse is also possible. Then instead of having the work output, if we supply the work input, we can make the energy flow from, from the low temperature to the high temperature. And this thing is known as refrigerator. Okay. So refrigerator is something that we discussed uh, uh, it, it's something that we discussed in in chapter number six when we were discussing the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, basically, refrigerator and the heat pump uh, practically works over the same principle. So we have the same principles over which the refrigerator and uh, the uh, heat pump works and they work over the reverse Carnot cycle. Now let me just remind you about the Carnot cycle. When we draw the TS diagram of the Carnot cycle, it is something like this. So TS diagram would be like a perfect square, okay? And it will be moving in this direction like this. So we have one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to one. So one to two is basically considered as compression. Then two to three, we have Q in, heat addition. Then three to four, we have uh, expansion. Okay, and four to one, we have Q out, heat rejection. This is for the case of the Carnot cycle. Now, when we are dealing with the refrigerator or heat pump, now we have to deal with the reverse Carnot cycle, reverse Carnot cycle. Now, reverse Carnot cycle would again look like as, as, as a square, but the direction would be opposite. So it would be like this, 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 this. So one, two, uh, the compression process here will be from here to one to two on this side. Okay. Then two to three, uh, we will have, previously it was Q in, now it will be Q out. So we'll have condenser here out because it's actually a opposite to to the regular Carnot cycle then three to four we'll have the expansion process okay and uh, four to one uh, previously four to one was Q out now here it will be Q in okay here it will be Q in so this will be the reverse Carnot cycle, and this reverse Carnot cycle is something which is going to be, which, which we are going to be dealing with in case of the refrigeration cycle or for the case of the heat pump. Now uh, let's discuss, uh, uh, as we discussed previously, because this this is going to this, this is going to work over R one three four A as a working fluid. So we have to adjust the cycle according to the needs of the working fluid. Now R134A is a very similar working fluid to that of the water. For the case of the water, we had to modify the cycle so that the Carnot cycle could be applied for water, for, for, for the properties of the water. And so uh, we modified that Carnot cycle and it was given the name Rankine cycle. Here, when we're talking about the refrigeration systems, they will be working over R134A as a working fluid, which is similar to water uh, with little different in the properties. However, again, it will be a vapor cycle because there will be boiling, there will be condensation that will occur into the cycle. Then we have to modify the cycle a little. Okay, so let's see the modified uh, cycle for the case of uh, refrigeration systems. 
The first thing is that uh, there's, there's, this is the same discussion that we cannot employ the reverse Carnot cycle directly inside the dome for, uh, uh, for the case of R134A. The reason being in the compression and in the expansion stages. In the compression and expansion stages, compressor cannot deal with two fluids uh, with, with two phases of the fluid it cannot deal with the vape, with the with the liquid and the gas content at the same time. So the gas compressors are different, and the vapor compressors are different. <clears throat> and the and the liquid compressor, basically the pumps are different. So here, what we are going to do is that we are going to keep the compression stage in the superheated region. Okay, and uh, uh, the other thing is the expansion. Now you have to understand one thing. We need to have expansion that cause the pressure to drop from the high pressure to the low pressure. But uh, if we use the turbine, the turbine is going to produce the work output where we do not need the work output in case of the refrigerator. Okay, since we do not need the work output, the turbine is a very expensive item to go for. Other than turbine, we can look for any other device which can actually drop the pressure. So the two other possibilities are nozzle and throttling device. Nozzle also drops the pressure and throttling device also drop the pressure. But the nozzle, while dropping the pressure, it increases the velocity significantly. And here in the refrigerator, we don't need very high velocity. It's not the jet engine. So we don't need high velocity. So again, the, 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 the option of nozzle is dropped. Turbine it will be a very expensive option. It can reduce the pressure, but it will be a very expensive option because turbine is an expensive equipment. On the other hand, the third and the most suitable and feasible option here would be to use an uh, would be to use the throttling device. Now, throttling device is a very small device, very cheap, very inexpensive device, and it can actually reduce the pressure from high pressure to low pressure. And this expansion process we are going to now deal with the we are going to now do with the uh, with the throttling device so now let's have a look at it how does our reverse Carnot cycle or the refrigeration cycle looks like so we have a compressor which now we are going to use in the superheated state okay so it's probably going to start at saturated vapor and then it's going to do the compression and so it's going to cause superheating of the vapor uh, to high pressure, and then after that uh, we do uh, we, we pass it through the condenser. Where first de superheating is done, then after that condensation is done, and at the exit of condenser we have saturated liquid. Then this saturated liquid is then passed through the expansion device, which is the expansion valve. And the expansion valve, if you remember, the expansion valve is a throttling valve, and we discussed it in chapter number five. The throttling process will have the same enthalpy. So enthalpy remains same. It's basically an isenthalpic process where the enthalpy remains same. So from three to four, it will be the same enthalpy. From three to four, it will be the same enthalpy. Uh, so we, we will have an isenthalpic expansion. And then at the result of this isenthalpic expansion, we'll have a combination of vapor and liquid produced which we are going to pass it through the evaporator. The evaporator is basically the boiler here, which is going to take heat from the cold space and then uh, convert the liquid part into the vapor. And so we have a saturated vapor at the exit of the evaporator, which is then fed back into the compressor. So this is how the cycle operates. Now here, uh, the important thing is that the place where we generate the cooling effect is here, four to one. This is the place where we generate the cooling effect. Okay, because here at this place, when the refrigerant has to boil inside the evaporator, is going to take heat from outside. And when the when the heat is going to be taken out from the outside, when the outside is going to become cold. And this is where the cooling is done. Okay, so this is the place where the cooling is done. This is the condenser two to three from where the heat is being rejected out into the system. Compressor is the place where we supply the work in. Okay, so this is the work input, mostly in the form of electrical energy. We, we, we connect our refrigerator to electrical socket to provide the electrical energy it's to run the compressor. And this actually causes the generation of cooling effect in the evaporator.
So anyways, this is the design and this is the operation of uh, the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. It is composed of four processes. One to two is it will be isentropic compression. Two to three will be constant pressure heat rejection in a condenser. Three to four will be the throttling in an expansion device. Four to one will be the constant pressure heat absorption in an evaporator. And these are the four processes and the four devices in a cyclic manner, this is how the system works. So the schematic diagram and the TS diagram is shown to you. The next thing is uh, looking at, there, there's another diagram which is significantly used in the, in the analysis of refrigerators and that is the pH diagram. The pH diagram has an advantage that because we have two constant pressure processes, so when you have the constant pressure processes, so they are going to be represented by a horizontal line. And then we have uh, a throttling device where we have an isenthalpic process. And enthalpy remains constant. So for within the pH diagram, isenthalpic process is going to be represented by a vertical line. So we'll have two horizontal and one vertical line. And so it's mostly the refrigerators or the heat pumps are more easily analyzed uh, by using the pH diagram. So pH diagram is one fundamental diagram which is significantly used in the analysis of the refrigerators or heat pump. Okay, the other thing is that uh, whether it is refrigerator of your, let's say we call it a fridge or it's a freezer, or if it is, let's say, if it is a dispenser, or, or if it is uh, your window AC unit or a split AC unit or the AC of your car, whatever be the air conditioning unit it is, it always have these four components and it follows always follows the same cycle. One, of, one example shown here is that of the fridge, the regular fridge that we have in our homes. The top side is a freezer, the bottom side, we, bottom side we call it as fridge. At the bottom we have, at the ba bottom back we have the compressor the compressor is then con connected with the condenser coils. Okay, it's from the condenser coils, it goes into the capillary tube. The capillary tube here acts as a throttling device. From the capillary tube, we enter into the evaporator coils. And within the evaporator coils, we have the cooling effect produced. And so we have the freezer at the top of the, of the fridge. And then from the freezer compartment, the cold goes also goes into the fridge compartment. So anyways, this is further connected to the compressor and the cycle continues like this. So anyways, this is just a schematic showing how the refrigeration cycle and the components are connected together in a regular fridge or refrigerator that we normally use in our homes. But as I told you, whether it is the home fridge, deep freezer, whether it is the AC of your car, whether it is any device which is producing cooling, it will have the same refrigeration cycle, will have the same components. Okay, so uh, next is the, the analysis of, 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 of a problem related to refrigeration system. If anybody wants to ask anything, you can ask. Uh, otherwise, let's have a break of five minutes and then we are going to start the numerical. I wanted to ask about the uh, no, sorry, difference sorry, between sorry. a pelletier fridge and the regular fridge. Once again, once again. Uh, the difference between a regular fridge and a pelletier fridge. Ah, pelletier effect. Now, pelletier effect is an entirely different thing. I mean, uh, we are not we are not actually discussing about the pelletier effect here or the pelletier, the cooling induced by the pelletier effect, but that is an entirely different thing. I mean. If you want, we can discuss it, discuss it later, but that's not the topic of the subject here right now. So, thank you. Okay, okay let's have a break of five minutes. You can put, uh, I think you have already placed your attendance, if, but if somebody have not yet placed your attendance, so kindly place it in the chat box. We'll, we will continue after five minutes.
Okay, so now let's start with with a numerical related with the refrigeration system. So, so we have R134A is the working fluid in an ideal compression refrigeration cycle. The refrigerant leaves the evaporator at minus 20 degrees centigrade. So you know the temperature at which the refrigerant leaves the evaporator and has a condenser pressure of 0.9 megapascal. The mass flow rate is three kg per minute. Find the COP uh, and the COP of the Carnot cycle for the same Tmax and Tmin and the tons of refrigeration. So let's analyze uh, the problem. First of all, we have the cycle like this. Okay, and um, this will be the TS diagram for the cycle. That will be state point one, two, three, four. Now, if I write this stuff here, P, T, X, V, H, S. So we'll have four state points, one, two, three, four. So R134 is a working fluid in an ideal compression refrigeration cycle. The refrigerant leaves the evaporator at 20 degree, minus 20 degrees centigrade. So we know the temperature at the exit of evaporator, which will be state point one. We know the temperature, okay. And uh, has a condenser pressure of 0.9 megapascal. So condenser pressure will be P2 and P3. That will be the condenser pressure and that will be 0.9 megapascal. So we know P2. You know P3. T1 will be the same as T4 because it is in the two-phase zone. So we also know T4. Okay. The mass flow rate of is 3 kg per minute. Now we need to find out the COPs. Now there are two things uh, pretty understood here that uh, uh, state point one, it should be the saturated vapor and state point three, it should be the saturated liquid. So that means we know the X for state point one and three. So one we know is X and three we know X. Now we can do the, our analysis since we know T and X in the state point one. So we can find H and we can find S because one to two is a compressor, compression process. So we consider it to be isentropic. So if we know S1, that means we know S2. And if we know S2 and P, so we can actually find out what is H. Similarly, for state point three, we know P and X, so we can find temperature as well as we can find H. And this H will be the same as H4 because three to four is a throttling process. So this is, this is how we're going to deal with. So we have T1 and X1. From this, we can determine H1 and S1. And then we know P2 and S2, since S1 will be the same as S2. So we're going to determine T, S, T2, S, and H2. Yes, and then correspondingly, since we know P3 and X3, we can find what is H3 and S3, okay? And similarly, we can find what is T4, and we, we, we know what is T4, and we know that H4 will be equals to S3, uh, H3. So based on that, we can determine what is the COP. COP will be output over the input, and we know the output here in this case will be the cooling effect produced at the evaporator. That will be H1 minus H4, and the input will be the electrical energy provided at the compressor. That will be H2 minus H1. So just we need to substitute the values, and we can get what is the coefficient of performance. And then if we have this multiplied by the mass flow rate, we're going to get... Uh, the, the, the cooling load or the refrigeration load. 
Now here, there is one thing which is asked that determine the tons of refrigeration. Now ton is, is a specific terminology used in the air conditioning sector. Uh, normally, we, normally we know in terms of the mass, one ton is 1000 kg. But uh, when we talk about tons of refrigeration in terms of uh, refrigeration systems or the AC systems, we does not mean one ton in terms of the mass, but one ton is a unit of energy. And it is basically equals to 3.516 kilowatt. So whatever the amount of energy we have, if we divide by 3.516, it's going to give us the amount of energy in tons. So normally when you go to purchase an air conditioner, so either it is like said that, okay, one ton AC, one, 1 1.5 ton AC or two ton AC. So this is the tons of energy, not tons of mass. So here uh, you have, once you have, once you know the refrigeration load, the cooling load just divide by 3.516 and it's going to give us you know, 1.94 ton of refrigeration effect. We can also determine the Carnot efficiency, but the Carnot efficiency is TL over TH minus TL. This is the same formula we, de we discussed in chapter number six. So we just need to substitute the values here and going to get the COP of the Carnot cycle. So that means the maximum efficiency, which was for the case of the Carnot refrigeration cycle was 3.97 under these temperature conditions. And here the, the COP for this system is actually 3.44. So it's pretty close. It's, it's uh, it's, it's a very nice working refrigerant uh, refrigeration system. Then let's say we have another problem here. So we have a refrigerator that uses uh, R134A as the working fluid and operates on an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle between 0.14 and 0.8 megapascal. So the pressures, the, this is the low pressure and this is the high pressure. So low pressure means this is P1 and P4. High pressure means this is be P2 and P3. Uh, if the mass flow rate of the refrigerant is 0 0.05 kg per second, determine the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space. So here we will have the refrigerated space. So rate of heat removal from, from the refrigerated space will be Q dot L. So this is what we need to determine. Uh, and the power input to the compressor. Power input to the compressor. Compressor is between one to two. So the power input to the compressor will be will, will be W dot N. And the rate of heat rejection to the environment. So the amount of heat rejected to the environment will be the amount of heat rejected by the condenser. So that will be QH here. Okay. And the COP of the refrigerator. Obviously, COP is the efficiency that we need to determine. So let's uh, start the solution. So we know what is P1 corresponding to P1. We can determine what is H1 and S1. Uh, and uh, then we know what is P2. And we say that S2 is equals to the same as S1. So we can determine H2. So P3, we know that it is saturated liquid. So we can determine what is H3. And once we know H3, that will be the same as H4. So we determined all the four H's. Once you have all the four edges, then use the, those enthalpy values to determine the cooling load and then determine the work input. And then you can actually use to determine the amount of energy rejected by the condenser and use Q dot L and W in, in the formula for COP to determine the coefficient of performance. So it's pretty straightforward. There's nothing uh, complicated here uh, in the solution. Now let's move towards uh, actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle. When we talk about actual cycle, so our actual cycle will always have a small difference with the ideal cycle in the terms that whenever we are considering an ideal cycle, we assume that there are no irreversibilities in the system and the compression and the expansion process are isentropic in nature. But in reality here, when we have the actual cycle, you have uh, pressure drops in different devices and in the, in the heat exchangers. And we have uh, 
uh, we have uh, irreversibilities. So we have an increase in entropy or entropy generation, then the expansion and the compression processes. So here we have the compression process in the compressor. And so obviously from one to two, it should be from one to two A and one to two S. So there will be some uh, entropy generation. So there will be some irreversibility and some losses within the compressor. Then after that, it passes through the condenser. And again, we are going to have some pressure drop at the condenser side. Then after condenser, it goes into the expansion device. So there will be, again, some entropy generation within the expansion device. And then from the expansion device goes through the evaporator. So there will be some pressure drop within the evaporator as well. So in any case, uh, in the overall terms, there will be a little change in the, uh, in the schematic diagrams and the TS diagrams for actual process compared to the ideal process. So let's have a numerical related with an actual process. Refrigerant R134A enters the compressor of a refrigerator as superheated vapor. So here, if you look here, normally we assume that when the refrigerant is entering into the compressor, it should be saturated vapor. But here it's already mentioned that it is not saturated vapor, it is superheated vapor. And uh, the pressure and the temperature is provided. Uh, at a rate of 0 0.05 kg per second and leaves at 0.8 megapascal and 50 degrees centigrade. So the in, inlet and exit to the compressor are provided in terms of the temperature and pressure. The refrigerant is cooled in the condenser to 26 degrees centigrade and 0.72 megapascal. So you see here, even within the condenser, there is a drop in pressure. So from 0.8 to 0.72, that means there is about 0 0.08 megapascal drop, pressure drop within the condenser as well. And it's throttled to about 0.15 megapascal. Disregarding any heat transfer and pressure drop in the connecting lines between the components determine the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space and the power input to the compressor. Uh, the isentropic efficiency of the compressor and the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator. The problem itself is very simple. If you analyze, if you, if you understand the refrigeration cycle itself, then the problem is not that much complicated. So we have a state point one. It is not saturated vapor. It's actually in the superheated zone. And we know the temperature and the pressure. Then at the exit of the compressor, you see here that it, we know that what is the temperature and pressure. So again, this will not be an isentropic process. So we know what is the state point two, we know what is the state point one. Then at the exit of condenser process, we know the pressure and temperature. And if you look here, we are gonna end, in, end up at, in the subcooled region of the compressed liquid region. And then after that, after that, we have the expansion in the throttling device. And then after that, we have the uh, evaporation or the cooling effect produced within the evaporator. So let's analyze the problem. Since we know what is P1 and T1, we're going to use this value to determine H1. Similarly, we know P2 and T2. We can use this to determine H2. We have P3 and T3. We can use this to determine H3. And when you know H1, H2, H3, H3 will be the same as H4 because this is a throttling process. The next thing is that we need to determine that what is the amount of uh, heat removed from the, uh, from the refrigerated space. So that's the cooling load. It will be at the evaporator. So it will be H1 minus H4 multiplied by M dot. Similarly, the amount of work needed by the compressor or the electrical energy needed by the compressor, it will be H2 minus H1. Then we can determine what is the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. If you remember, this is the formula for the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. You studied this formula where? You studied this formula in chapter number seven. So here we know H1, we know H2, what about H2S? So we can determine H2S by the logic here that uh, at state point one, we know the pressure and we know the temperature. Based on this, we can determine what is S1. And then we say that S1 is the same as S2. And this uh, compressor is designed to raise the pressure from one to two. So we know what is P2. So we're going to use the P2 and S2 value to determine 
the enthalpy H2 and this will be H2S because we are using the isentropic logic. So that will be our H2S. So we have P2 and we have S2. We're going to use these to determine H2S. And once we have H2S, we're going to substitute in here and we can determine what is the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. Since we already determined Q dot L and WN, so we can determine what is the COP of the refrigerator. After that, we have some innovative vapor compression refrigeration systems uh, that involve the cascade refrigeration and multi-stage compression refrigeration. But anyways, these two kind of different systems are something we are going to discuss in our last lecture, inshallah, next week. So at this point, I would say that uh, our lecture is finished. If you have any question regarding anything, any topic, any anything regarding what we covered in the class, any numerical which is not clear, you can ask. Otherwise, our lecture is finished now. If you want, you can leave the, the class. Okay, that's it. We can leave the class now.